Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. He is still out there. This is the man that police are still looking for who they believe is behind two attempted kidnappings not far from two local schools. That is parents on edge tonight. You can understand why on mm -hmm. Friday, San Antonio police say the man tried to force a woman into his car by Wales Avenue and Killarney Drive. Then on Saturday, they say a man matching that same description tried to snatch a 12 year old on Vietnam Street and Elgin on the southeast side. Those incidents happen about 2.5 miles apart near SAISD schools. Garrett Berger talked with families at one of those schools who were anxious about more than just the start of classes again today. Rogers Middle School is less than a mile from where a woman fought off her would-be kidnapper on Friday. It's too close to home. And a second attempt on Saturday was next to Highlands High School. After the two incidents, one woman at Rogers didn't even want her grandson taking the bus. But he still has to walk a block down to the house. And a mother who didn't want to show her face remembered her own close call as a teen. Van pulled up, opened the back doors, tried grabbing me and my friend and pulling us into the van, so we took off running. Though people we spoke to hadn't seen them yet, SAISD told us these identical letters were going out to Rogers and Highlands families today. They say San Antonio and district police have increased patrols of the neighborhoods and campus staff have been made aware. They encourage kids to walk in groups and be aware of their surroundings. Advice echoed by the police. Tra travel in pairs if you can. Do not have headphones in your ears. Always be aware of what's going on. Families we talk to say they're already protected. I've definitely been, you know, watching out more. I have cameras at home, so definitely keeping a closer eye on them. I don't let my child walk anywhere. I drive her everywhere. So I'm just like that. I'm scared something might like that might happen. Police have described the suspect as an 18 to 25 year old Hispanic man, about 5'9 and 175 pounds, with brown hair and brown eyes. The car is thought to be a 2009 to 2010 maroon Nissan Murano. If you have any information, police want you to call their special victims unit. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. It has been the site of Final Fours and NBA championship games, but tonight it will be at the center of a joint task force emergency operation. Yeah, we're talking about the Alamo Dome. The SAPD, FBI, and others will descend on the dome at some point tonight to simulate an emergency operation. Our John Paul Barajas is there now. John Paul, we don't know what will happen inside the dome, but we're expecting some action outside of it tonight, right? Steve, Myra, that's what we're hearing, that at some point there will be uh uniformed officers and even a helicopter that people in the area will likely see. But at that at this point in time, we're still waiting to see when that will actually happen. As for what we've seen out here so far, not much. And the only little bit of activity that we have seen was behind me at this fold-out table that it's also seemed to have cleared out by now. We can go to video to show you what it looked like closer to five. Just a lot of people there, a big group, uh, mainly in civilian clothing, a few of them with FBI jackets. It looked like maybe a sign-in or check-in area. As mentioned, uh, we have have the FBI San Antonio Division, SAPD, SAFD working as a joint training. We don't know what scenarios will be uh, looking like inside or outside at this point, but we do know that they are going to be working on emergency responses and that they will have no interactions with people in the area and surrounding areas. This is what a special agent Oliver Rich had to say. It's an essential part of what we do. It's not just the joint operations, it's the, it's the relationships that we have with here in San Antonio, with San Antonio Police Department, all across this region with, with our local and state law enforcement partners. It, it is essential for us to be able to do our jobs most effective, in the most effective way. And again, although these trainings aren't expected to have any interactions with those in the surrounding areas, uh, people who don't know about this might get startled by seeing some of the outside activities or maybe even hearing things that are going inside the Alamo Dome. So make sure to pass the word along to friends, family, anybody who lives in the area or might be traveling through. That way they don't get startled or caught off guard. For the time being, we'll be out here monitoring the situation to see what exactly the trainings will look like and what we can hear from outside the Alamo Dome. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News.
Thank you, John Paul. Also happening right now, they are not staying quiet. Librarians with San Antonio ISD are protesting outside of tonight's school board meeting because of staff cuts. That protest began right before that meeting at 530. The staff cuts will mostly be affecting librarians. In a statement from SAISD, the district tells us the library services will be provided by staff rather than certified librarians. The district went on to say they will work with the people affected to find them other positions within the district. A train plowing into an 18 wheeler this morning in shirts and it was all caught on camera. Cheryl Penny was taking her daughter to Clements High School when they saw the 18 wheeler stuck on the train tracks at Shirts Parkway at FM 78. Penny's daughter got video of the collision on her cell phone camera. The train slamming into the 18 wheeler, cutting it in half. There you see it right there, sending a pickup truck. It was hauling, flying through the air. Shirts police said no one was injured. The driver did, it make, did make it out safely. He called 911, but it was too late to stop that train. I was blowing my horn and yelling like, hey, back up because this, this is going to happen. So you might as well get out the way so you don't get hurt. Takes a long ways for those trains to stop, sometimes as long as a mile. Shirts police tell us the truck did not have enough clearance, became high centered as it tried to cross the tracks. That was the problem. They also say if they are notified early enough, police will call Union Pacific to stop those oncoming trains. But like I said, they need a lot of notice to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look outside with live cam. I believe I described Monday as dreary. <laughs> I, I think I might have spoken too soon on that one. Drearier. 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 Let's just go all in more drearier. There you go. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and today, today actually it, it added up to something. This was a good, pleasant surprise. The persistent drizzle actually added up to 21 hundredths of an inch, so just over two tenths of an inch since midnight. That was good to see, and we did have some other area rain gauges right in line with that, so that was nice and actually helped a little bit. Didn't bust us out of our drought, but better than nothing. 72 our high temperature today, the average being three degrees warmer than that. Temperatures dropping down into the 60s and just holding steady in the upper 60s this evening, and I know we had some clearing out there this afternoon and this evening, but the Drizzle's going to kick start again late after midnight tonight and through tomorrow morning. So mid 60s tomorrow morning for the commute with more dampness. But we'll talk about the next cold front, where it's coming from, what it means for storms and the weekend in just a bit. All right, thank you, Adam. Let's check out traffic right now. Let's go to Highway 90 at 36th Street and you can see some puddles on the side of the road, but no major traffic tie ups to tell you about at this hour. A man died this morning in a house fire on the city's north side. That fire happened just after 730 in the 1000 block of West Summit Avenue. That's not too far from I-10 and Blanco. Firefighters say they got there to find flames shooting through the roof of this house. Fire officials say a couple lived at the home and the wife was awake when this fire started, but her husband, a man in his 80s, was asleep upstairs and she was unable to get him out of the house. A neighbor says the man who died lived at that home for over 60 years. It's terrible to see somebody go that way, you know, and all that. If I, if I would have known, I would have rushed in right away, but he was already got some flame. Fire officials told us this fire was started by a space heater downstairs. The name of that man who passed away has not yet been released. She was apparently just walking on the side of the road when she was hit, and tonight San Antonio police are searching for a suspect. That hit and run happened just before 11 o'clock last night in the 5400 block of Everts Road. That's near Loop 410 and Bandera Road on the west side. Officers say that woman was walking when she was hit by the vehicle. The driver did not stop to help. The woman taken to University Hospital with possible life-threatening injuries. Her condition still unknown at this time. Police say there is no description of the vehicle. The driver has not been found. It is the first Ukrainian restaurant in San Antonio, created with pride and some hope. One of the owners is actually from Ukraine. Many of her family and friends are still living in that war-torn country. She tells our Courtney Friedman how she is sharing her culture with San Antonio while supporting the people she loves that are in Ukraine. 
Much of Ukraine lies in ruins as the war there presses on. But when you walk into the new European Dumplings Cafe in Castle Hills, the first thing you see is this painted wall, yellow wheat and sunflowers at the bottom and blue sky above. This is represents the Ukrainian flag. This is make me like um, proud about my country. And I hope it will be back again soon, yeah. like clear, beautiful. Olga Vedekenyek grew up in Ukraine, moving to Oregon in 1993 and San Antonio a year and a half ago with her husband, Simon Gutierrez. She still has family and friends in Ukraine. We're from Bakhmut. They lost all their houses, I mean, everything. The couple now sponsoring seven Ukrainians, bringing them to San Antonio, including a family friend who was badly injured in the war. They fundraised many times for Ukrainian refugees. And Saturday, that community showed their appreciation when they opened the first Ukrainian restaurant in San Antonio. 300 people here. Tremendous amount of people showed mm -hmm. up. And not only Ukrainians, but Latinos and uh, Americans, you know, and blacks and Asians, and Muslims. They were all here supporting us. They were, mm -hmm. We would run out of food. And it probably won't be the last time they run out. The food is that good. This is yeah traditional Ukrainian borscht, and I mean, uh, when I was like a little girl, we was eating borscht every day. Oh my gosh, that's just comfort food. On day three of opening, customers were already coming back second and third times. I have a goosebump. Giving Veda Kenyak a true sense of hope for the people and land she loves so much. These doors are now officially open every Wednesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. You gotta come try it for yourself. Courtney Friedman, case at 12 News. Believe it or not, we are one month away from Fiesta, and today the Fiesta San Antonio Commission held their annual media day to talk about the exciting plans for this year's Fiesta. There are some changes, though, to this year's events, including a big one, a new location for Fiesta Fiesta. The event will be held at Travis Park this year. The move due to construction on Alamo Street at Hemisphere Park there will also be two new official events, one being held by Central Catholic High School, the other by the Girl Scouts. All the organizations at Media Day were there showing off their events to raise money for local nonprofits. All the organizations are really gearing up for a full fiesta this year. We're very excited for the whole gamut of all the fiesta events to be back to normal. Back to normal. Fiesta begins April 20th. It'll run until the 30th. For more information, head to FiestaSanAntonio.org. Org. And yes, we are your Fiesta station. That's right. You still head on the news at six. The role stress from chemotherapy plays on a cancer patient's memory. What researchers have found so far. Next. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's just a peek as to what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. So it started with a pledge to honor the lives of those who were lost in Uvalde. And now family members say that their loss was used for someone else's gain. I thought he had good intentions. I really did. Tonight on the Night Beat, their frustration in their own words and the promise that Uvalde's mayor says was made but never fulfilled. We'll see you for that story and so much more tonight on the night beat. Thank you, Stephanie. I'll see you then. All right. Well, as we age, the chances increase that we'll all have memory lapses, forgetfulness, a decline in cognitive function. COVID infections can be a culprit, but so could the stress of chemo and radiation. Ursula Perry explains why inflammation could be the cause, particularly when it comes to the memory of cancer patients. Acute inflammation is easy to see. A cut, redness, or swelling. It's your body's response to injury. But chronic inflammation is often invisible, with no telltale signs that it's wrecking your body. It's always been thought that inflammation can potentially have a connection between cognitive changes, even in non-cancer patients. Now cancer researchers want to know what role chronic inflammation caused by physical or emotional stress can play on a patient's cognition. In a recent study, they took blood from 400 breast cancer survivors to measure their C-reactive protein or CRP levels. These inflammatory markers or proteins in your blood can be elevated when the body is under some form of stress. Dr. Graham and colleagues at Georgetown found that chronic inflammation may play a role in development of cognitive problems. And they say by identifying a scientific predictor for memory problems, they may be able to help patients prevent it. 
I don't think that's, it's going to be a one and done, but I think this is a step. Brain fog can be a lot like real fog. It comes up very slowly, but eventually takes completely over. Now the doctors are trying to identify the ways in which to drop your inflammation. And while medicine may not be a cure, other interventions could be like forcing yourself to do meditative exercises, things that force your brain to focus. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Okay, dreary wasn't working for us earlier, so maybe we could go with gloomy for today's weather. That gloomy? works. Gloomy? Yeah. Okay. Rolls it, off the tongue better than... Whatever you say, Myra. Drearier. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, that's how it always goes. I go Most with Myra. Dreariest. <laughs> dreariest. Dreary yeah, I like that. Yeah. Gloomy. Mm -hmm. Gloomy Tuesday. You know, quite often, I would say just kind of a nasty morning, but this actually added up to something. Between well, last night and today, we picked up a quarter of an inch at the airport. That was a nice little surprise from all the drizzle that the drizzle got heavy enough for a prolonged period of time to actually mean a little bit of something. But more fog and drizzle and sprinkles on the way starting later on tonight. So another damp morning commute tomorrow. Then a Friday cold front coming in from the Pacific, not having a big impact on temperatures, but giving us a chance of storms for early Friday. Maybe even a few severe storms. We'll show you where we can see that right now. Let's talk about our pattern. Actually, a little bit of clearing, especially off to the west. We'll show you in a minute how that affected temperatures. But notice that swirl, that big pinwheel over California coming on shore. That's the next upper level disturbance that's moving in from the Pacific, of course, pounding them with more rain and higher elevation snow. I mean, too much of a good thing, especially at the higher elevations. Anyway, this is going to be headed our way and that's going to help push that Pacific cold front through Texas. So let's fast forward with our future cast. This is Thursday, 9 p.m. and we'll have a line of showers and storms developing along that cold front. That's in West Texas and North Texas. Sunrise Friday morning, scattered showers and storms along that front stretching from Del Rio to San Angelo, about Brownwood area up toward Dallas, Wichita Falls. And then even here in San Antonio, I think we could get clipped by some of those showers and storms. So we have a 40% chance. Higher odds as you get up into the hill country and especially Edwards Plateau. Now when it comes to the severe weather risk, some scattered severe storms likely from roughly Del Rio to Ozona to San Angelo to Abilene all the way up toward Wichita Falls. Meanwhile, you get closer to San Antonio and those severe chances really fall off. So I don't think we have to worry about any hail damage or straight line damaging winds with this around here. But in parts of the hill country, there is the off chance. But one out of five on a scale where you could have an isolated severe storm. That would be early on Friday morning around and even potentially before sunrise. Let's talk temperatures and dew points. You feel that stickiness back in the air. Dew points are way higher than the past several days. Dew point is 66. So you feel that mugginess and for the most part, dew points well into the 60s everywhere. This isn't going to change until we get to Friday afternoon. That Pacific cold front is not going to affect our temperatures a lot, but it will push in some much drier air. You know that gusty Westerly wind coming to that dry air coming in from West Texas and we'll be experiencing that on Friday. So expect that humidity to really drop those dew points falling down to 40 Friday afternoon and down in the lower 30s for those dew point temperatures on Saturday. And that will mean some cooler and somewhat crisp mornings by Saturday and Sunday. All right, let's talk temperatures and a lot of this has to do with cloud cover. 70 in Converse, 73 Stinson, 70 in Helota, 68 in Bulverde. Let's widen out the view. Look where we saw that clearing earlier in the day. Del Rio 81, along with Eagle Pass and Carrizo Springs. A little bit of sunshine goes a lo long way. Tomorrow morning, drizzle and sprinkles, 66 at 7 a.m. for the morning commute. By the early afternoon, some clearing, making it up to 80 degrees for the high temperature. But just like today, warmer out west. Del Rio 86, Catula Carrizo Springs, a high of 87. Locally, right around 80 degrees, give or take a degree. And looking ahead, highs don't change very much. Just some slightly cooler mornings, 52 Saturday and 52 on Sunday. So good mornings for weekend activities, to be honest with you. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. Spurs on the road trying to put together a win streak, Larry. Yes, it would be their second straight win if they can beat the Pelicans tonight. And Devontae Graham, who was traded from New Orleans to San Antonio, is back in New Orleans, staying at his own house. And he had a weird experience there the other night. Plus, Steve Lutz has three kids, and one of them has a very tough decision 
now that they're moving out to Western Kentucky. Coming up. Honestly, I did. Thought somebody was coming in my house. I was like, what in the world is going on? Devontae Graham went to his house in New Orleans and thought someone was breaking in, but it turned out to be a good surprise on game day. With the Spurs in New Orleans to play ball tonight, point guard Devontae Graham got to stay in his own house instead of the team hotel. The Pelicans traded him to the Spurs last month after a season and a half in the Big Easy, and he's been a great addition for the young Spurs to learn from. Going back to New Orleans and sleeping in his own house was cool, but Graham did have one nervous moment. It's always good to be back, you know. I got to go home last night to my house, lay in my bed for a little bit. My mom and my grandma actually surprised me last night. I didn't know they were coming. And I just heard somebody like typing in the code to get in my house. And I was like, what in the world? And they walked in. So it's definitely good. That's pretty cool. The Spurs are feeling better about themselves after their huge 24 point comeback win Sunday against the Hawks. Following morning shoot around at the Smoothie King Arena, Trey Jones was asked about using the momentum from that game. And that's when Keldon hijacked the interview. We had a big second half last game, uh, big on the defensive end. Um, you know, I think that was our best defensive half, you know, of the year. So try to continue to build off of that um, and start this road trip Stop off all right. Line. Stop on the road trip. Why you lying? He's not even playing. So he got a boo boo on his neck. That's what we want to do. Okay, bad foot. One foot. Kellen is out with a neck sprain or a boo-boo on his neck, as Trey said. Zach, Jeremy, and Devin will all sit. Trey and Doug are available. Pels will host the Spurs tonight at 7. I mean, at the end of the day, miss layups is usually focus or toughness, um, I think. So they're definitely physical. We knew that, that they were a physical team, um, and we needed to match that, and I don't think we necessarily did, which um, – translated to miss layups. Shea Hawley and the Texas Longhorns missed 15 layups last night in their second round loss to Louisville, 73-51 in Austin. This marks Louisville's sixth straight trip to the Sweet 16. Yeah, there was just some miss, missed assignments from us that, that we went over and, and we just weren't as locked in as we needed to be on some of those. Um, and they were hitting shots, you know. They're, they're a great team, and, and when they got their open shots, they were making them. Baylor led UConn 24-18 after the first quarter last night, but the Huskies would battle back to win 77-58 to eliminate the Bears in the second round of the NCAA tournament. He's the new king of the hill at Western Kentucky. Steve Lutz was introduced as the 16th men's basketball coach in Hilltoppers history yesterday. The San Antonio native left Texas A&M Corpus Christi after two wonderful seasons with two trips to the big dance. During his presser, Lutz was asked what did his wife and three kids say when he told them they're moving to the bluegrass state. You want the truth? <laughs> no. Um, no, I mean, um, probably the, the hardest part, obviously, is for my daughter McKenna because she's going to be a high school senior. Um, but with that being said, uh, they've all been great about all of our, our transitions, right? And we've made new friends everywhere that we've been. Um, obviously, when you go to a new place, um, there's excitement. But there's also, you know, uncertainty. Coach said they will make a family decision on what McKenna does for her senior year in high school. You know, having a daughter that's a senior this year, okay. I can understand the teenage angst yeah. about moving right before yeah. your senior year. That I would bet. be tough. It would be, right? For sure. Right. Thanks, Larry. Our KSAT Q&A with Mayor Ron Nirenberg is up next. A lot to talk about today in our KSAT Q&A with San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg, who joins us as he does most Tuesday evenings. Mayor, thanks for your time once again tonight. I uh, want to talk about one issue that the council is going to take up this week. This is inspections, proactive inspections of apartments, essentially multi-residential yeah. uh, locations. Tell us what the city's looking at there. Sure. Well, and I would say this is third time the charm. Uh, we tried to do this sort of policy several years ago when I was on the council, and I had to deal with a very bad actor who was managing an apartment complex on Wurzbach. But we've seen these challenges pop up from time to time where a, a, a landlord, a property uh, apartment owner, 
uh, manager is not taking care of the units is really letting them fall into disrepair to the detriment, uh, safety detriment of the residents. And so we are going to be uh, hearing about and, and likely passing a bad actor ordinance that holds property owners accountable for uh, the maintenance of their properties and to make sure that they address code issues, safety issues that come up uh, effectively and timely so that residents can live safely and with dignity. Uh, these are going to pertain to apartment complexes that have five units or more. If a complex falls into uh, code issues and complaints are made and they're not fixed in a timely manner, they'll find themselves on a registry, they'll pay a fee, and they'll have continued inspections over time. Uh, and in, an apartment can get off of that list, can graduate from that list by staying in compliance. Uh, and if they don't go back on the list, then you know everything should be good and that they should be taking care of their residents. But it's an effort to incentivize uh, property owners to maintain their properties to standard, uh, good standard condition. Uh, but it also will penalize property owners for letting the fall into a state of disrepair to the detriment of, of their residents. So the city council will be discussing that this week. I also want to talk about the the horrible, traumatic, horrendous dog attack that happened. Uh, it resulted in the death of an 81 year old man attacked by numerous dogs. The last time uh, we talked about this issue, I know there were a lot of questions about calls to 911, yeah. calls to 311, calls to animal care services, and you said that you had a lot of questions. Have you got yeah. those questions answered at this point? I've gotten some of the answers, and I think a, a lot of those will be made public uh, during a meeting on April 5th. Uh, the city manager has issued a memo to the city council addressing some of those questions, mainly related to how we can get better coordination between departments like SAPD, like code compliance and ACS. So when a particular property has a lot of calls, whether that's one of the departments or several of the departments, they don't fly under the radar. Um, this is gonna be called a good neighbor program, which will allow for uh, properties that are getting a lot of calls in any of these departments to begin to generate escalating uh, penalties and increased scrutiny so that we can prevent something like this from happening. Um, you know, the, the, the sad part of all of this um, is that, you know, there, this property uh, that, you know, was uh, the subject of, of this dog attack had numerous police uh, responses, et cetera. And we need to have uh, some response that goes across departments so that when they're flagged for these types of calls, we, we'll know that there's a potential issue there with a dangerous dog at the same time. So that's not happening right now? It's not, uh, and part of that is pretty typical to all cities in which all of these departments are siloed, have their own data management systems. And so one of the things that we'll be calling for is to have those data management systems in a way that allows for the sharing information. And so that if there's a property that generates a lot of calls, we know that they're not being a good neighbor and we can ensure that there's a proper response to prevent incidents from happening in the first place. There's a lot of other things going on. There, there have been uh, our own De Bear County delegation has filed several pieces of legislation to close policy gaps that really prevent proper investigations of dangerous dogs from taking place. So we hope we can get some of that done as well. And then, of course, uh, this week, in fact, tomorrow, we'll be hearing uh, the animal care services comprehensive plan, which has been underway for you know the last year, really addressing the major issues uh, and ensuring that the city council, when we, it comes budget time, can properly resource the right things for the ACS department to be able to fire on all cylinders. There's a lot of things that we need to do comprehensively, some of them just uh, to make sure that we have proper ACS services happening in the city, but also to ensure that we close policy gaps that uh, could prevent an incident from happening in the future. Yeah, you know, that attack happened several weeks ago now, and it is still something that we are getting comments on daily. People asking questions right. about, you know, dogs they believe are dangerous in their own neighborhoods or stray animals in general. So we'll wait and find out more information as the city reveals it on, and, on and, some further and plans. Mara, if, if I could, I would encourage folks who have concerns about an animal, a dangerous animal who has maybe attacked another pet or, you know, heaven forbid, attacked a person, to make those calls, uh, to call 311 or if it's an emergency, call 911 so we can file those cases. Because I do know that ACS is going through those cases and putting extra effort 
to ensure that we're clearing cases and making sure that we're, we're addressing and investigating those dangerous dogs and, and putting additional manpower on that in the meantime. And then we'll work on the comprehensive actions going forward. Mayor, let's turn now to the emergency training operation that's happening at the Alamo Dome this evening. We had a live report outside. Our cameras not allowed inside for that training. But can you talk about why the dome itself is being used and anything that neighbors who live in that area can expect tonight? You know, it's really unfortunate that we have to do these kinds of trainings, but we we live in an era where uh, attacks have happened and we have to be prepared for them to happen in the future. And we certainly don't want to see anything like that happen in San Antonio, but ensuring that all of our law enforcement agencies across departments are properly trained, we've got to have the right venues and circumstances and conditions for them to train. So the Alamo Dome is available. We have been working with law enforcement to ensure that they have the proper resources available to ensure they have the best of training and they can keep our community safe. Um, this is a little bit different than what had happened um, about a year ago where there was a military training exercise. And I think the challenge there was there wasn't enough uh, public notification. So we've made an extra effort to make sure that people around the area are notified. Uh, we don't expect to, to, to hear uh, the same kind of disruption that we saw in the military exercise. This is more internal. Uh, but there will be a, some action there uh, at the Dome, and, and we want to make sure that people know it's it's for the reason of protecting our community. It's a drill. It's practice. It's not the real thing, but we want to make sure that anybody who needs to respond to the real thing will be ready. All right, quickly before we let you go, the latest on the construction on St. Mary's Strip. Uh, late March, early April was the initial timeline. Are you still thinking that's going to be the timeline for that construction to be completed? You know, that's... That's what I'm holding staff and contractors accountable to, and I haven't heard differently. Uh, you know, this is getting really ridiculous uh, to see all these orange cones everywhere and not see folks working. So we need to get these projects done. And if not, I want to hear publicly why they're not getting done. Uh, you know, there's been weather, of course, and those are going to create delays, but we've seen this project now unfold for far too long. And so, um, you know, again, we're going to hold contractors and, and management accountable to getting these projects done timely. Uh, and if not, getting a, a, a thorough explanation as to why not. All right, Mayor Ron Nirenberg, we'll check back in on that and several more of the issues that we talked about here this evening. Thanks for being here. Thank you all. Have a good night. Take care. We'll be right back.